Hey, everybody. <laughs> We're live. Yay. Okay. So I'm excited because I have an interview guest today. I have Heather Dimmitt Fletcher, and she's with Colabri. And she's been part of the nonprofit world for a really long time and recently broke out onto her own and is doing consulting with nonprofits. And the reason that I invited her on is because I, I put up a post earlier this summer and I asked for great online event ideas. And Heather immediately commented back, Monica, events are not a marketing plan. And at first I was like, um, no, no, they're not. I did not mean to imply that they were. And then I, so I was like, okay, well, I'll just tell her no. And then, and then um, I realized that Hmm. after a few more other conversations with nonprofit professionals who were also kind of like, feeling that same frustration that people felt like their events were actually their marketing plan. I was like, man, maybe we should have a conversation about this and kind of explore it a little bit more. So Heather, why don't you tell us your story and kind of explain how you got where you are right now? Sure. So I, as Monica said, I have 25 over 25 years in profit, social services, education, that whole round. I've done. Oh no. You're cutting out. I am like the lady of technical difficulties today. I don't understand it. Oh. I swear we were talking really good before I went live. And now, of course, I go live and Heather disappears. Well, she's not disappeared. She's just frozen. And at least she has a very nice smile on her face. <laughs> oh, no. Heather, if you can hear me, um, I will remove you and you can jump back in. <laughs> I'm sorry. And now I'm hanging out by myself. And I'm really not the person who's supposed to be talking about this. <laughs> well, yay. I'm just here. Hanging out. Heather will come back. She will. I have all the faith. She's not going to leave me here all by myself. Because I'm not actually my interview guest today. I, I have Heather as my interview guest. And she's just having internet challenges. But I'm telling you, today is like, you know, I call myself a tech girl. But my microphone wouldn't work. My camera wouldn't work. I had to reschedule meetings because internet wouldn't work. And now I'm still living in the <laughs> other people's internet free zone. Like what is happening? What is happening? Whoever's there, hi, hello. I'm excited to see you. <laughs> I'll just be here making frowny faces all day long. Frowny face, frowny face. Hi. Hi, new friend. It's good to see you. I wish that your name like showed up in here. It doesn't show up in here. I would recognize you by name. See, I'm having technical difficulties in my guest. She's like not there and, and her internet's broke and it's very sad. And so I'm hanging out by myself and, um, <laughs> being on Facebook Live by myself. Yes. Yes. Maybe we should try again. Right? Maybe. I wish I could unlive myself and then relive myself. Is that possible? Definitely editing out the first half of this video. Definitely. Oh, I guess, I mean, like I have a song in my head. I guess I could sing it. That would be really weird. So I won't do that. No. 
I won't, I'm just going to hang out here in my office. Hey, do you guys want to meet my dog? She's behind me. I guess you can't really see her unless I move my camera. So she's sleeping right down there. Do you see her? That's Roxy. Yeah. She's my oldest child. Um, and then I have Quimby on the other side of my desk while I'm waiting for Heather to actually get internet working. Please, internet, please work. Oh, no. Okay. Yay. <laughs> She's back. Apparently, too many people are using the internet in my neighborhood because everything crashed. Oh, you know what? I was actually in a meeting earlier this week recording a podcast, and the whole power went out at my house. <laughs> and I'm like, what's going on? Like, I... Yeah. So and I tried getting it on my phone and I couldn't either. So I sent you a chat, but I don't think you actually saw it. <laughs> I saw it just now. I was introducing people to my dog. I thought about singing. We're definitely I heard you. I can't after this video whenever I get into it after I finish. Whoa. <laughs> so I apologize. <laughs> Remember, we might have lost. <laughs> oh, it's okay. People like pick us up in a couple minutes. Um so Let's start back at where you tell us about your journey at how you got to where you are, your 25 years of experience. Right. So I have worked in both the programming side of nonprofits and education, like actually building the programs, building them up, um, promoting them. I've done fundraising, but then I've also had quite a bit of experience um, as an executive director. And as and in other leadership roles and nonprofits, and I have a lot of experience taking over struggling nonprofits or nonprofits that are trying to grow, and then when I leave them, leaving them with quite a bit of money sitting in reserves um, mm -hmm. to where they can operate even without bringing in much more income for a year or so to make things happen. Which, especially in times like right now, is really nice to have sitting there in the bank. Um, though a lot of nonprofits are having a great deal of success raising money right now. So especially if you are an organization that in any way is involved in human services or helping people or providing services to people, if you aren't raising money right now, you need to be. And if you're struggling to be raising money right now, you need to look at what your overall fundraising and your development plan is because that's where a lot of success has actually happened. So we started our conversation by talking about the fact that you were calling me out and thinking that I thought that events were a marketing plan. And I didn't really think that. <laughs> I mean, like, as a marketer, I do know that they're not, um, but they can be part of a marketing plan, right? Yeah. So um, I kind of wanted you to talk us through, um, you know, When's a good time to have an event? When's not? Like, what are they good for? How do they fit into the bigger picture? I don't even know what question to start with. Just tell me everything. <laughs> right. So I have to say this. When I saw the post, and I wasn't, it might have come out, lot out as I was trying to call you up, but, really, but it wasn't. But <laughs> the thing about events is whenever somebody says, we need to raise some money. We need to do X. They almost always default to, we need to have an event. And events have a place and a purpose and a time and an impact, but events aren't the sole solution to when it comes to raising money. And so the thing about an event or any, all events, is that they should be a part of your overall development mix, your overall fundraising mix. And so that means you need to have a development plan. You need to know where is your income coming in from? Where of those areas could you grow? And you want to make sure you have a balanced portfolio in your development plan. Because if you're relying solely on events, and a lot of organizations saw that with what was happening um, with all the stay-at-home orders, and even now when people are, a lot of people are afraid to be around a big group of people, fundraising events are suffering right now, and they're having to pivot pretty quickly. And that's what you were trying to do is to help people figure out how to pivot to online. And what I was actually meeting was saying that there might be some ways to be raising money right now, other than trying to pivot your great big large in-person event to being an online event. Um, so why do I say that events shouldn't be what you rely upon? Well, here's why. Events 
are extremely time intensive for staff and volunteers. Not only that, the ROI for events, a good event, you usually spend 35 to 50 cents for every dollar you will raise. And that may and or may not include staff time, depending upon which expert you're looking at as your measurement. And it definitely doesn't include volunteer time. When you start losing people being involved with your organization, especially volunteers, a lot of times it has to do with they're burned out from doing events for you. So that is the downside of events. When you compare that to something like an annual campaign that you're usually looking at spending 35 cents or less for every dollar you bring in, or a major gifts campaign or a capital campaign that you're looking at spending five to 25 cents for every dollar you bring in, you start seeing why events might not wanna be where you focus a great deal of your time and effort on. That said, people then often sometimes say, yeah, but events are a great public facing piece and that's how people find out about us and it's how we communicate. And they're right, events really are a great public, public facing piece, but that's where you go back to, and you're using your event for marketing purposes and you need to figure out how your event fits into your marketing plan. And if your only marketing plan is to have an event, that's a problem because it's the same kind of thing. You don't want your event to you don't want your event to be the only public facing image of your organization, but you do want your event to fit in to what the public facing image of your organization is supposed to be. And that's why you need a marketing plan. It all has to tie together. Really it yeah. does does all have to tie together. And the funny thing is, is when you're creating these plans, when you're creating a strategic plan and you're creating a development plan and you're creating a marketing plan, it is funny how much it does all reference each other and how many times you're like, I feel like I just put these exact same 10 strategies over here in this plan. And you probably did because you are pulling from each other and they do need to intermesh and interportinate. Yeah, I really feel like there's a lot of times, especially as you get bigger, when when you're smaller, one of the coolest things about being a small business or a small organization is that a lot of the times the same person that does the marketing does the sales. And so then you have like this very cohesive message, like, you know, what's going on. I mean, hopefully, hopefully. Right. I guess right. it can be completely off base, but but most of the time it's like all in the same vein. And then when you start dividing up responsibilities, the saddest thing is when, you know, the development is saying one thing and then marketing is saying another thing and they don't meet in the middle. It's like they they lost the message. Right. So, right. I mean, just I tasked Stacy, who is like our our head sales lady with making an ebook for me and I'm reading it and I'm like nodding my head. It's like I'm listening to a song. I'm like, this girl's right. so smart. Everything she says is so right. And then I realize it's because like I'm her marketer and she tells me all her stories and and we're in the same page. And I'm like, this makes me feel so happy. Right. But right. they don't always, you know, coincide. Right. Um, so if if they're um not if you're not gonna do events for all of your fundraising, like what else is there? There's grant writing, uh -huh. there's contract for services, there is, as we were talking about, annual campaigns, which a lot of people do an end of year letter writing campaign, but there's a lot of people that also do a mid-year letter writing campaign. In fact, there's a great deal of research showing that because so many people are sending out letters in November and December, that a good time to send out letters may actually be in April or May, right after people uh -huh. have just paid their taxes. Um, there is also your what you call your major gifts or you call a capital campaign. Capital campaigns are usually when you're looking to make a pretty significant large investment in either expanding the organization, whether it be expanding like a major new program expansion or if it's new equipment or if it's a new building expansion, you're building something along those lines. Mm -hmm. Whereas major gifts is wherever you're spending some time really investing in select donors that you've picked out, um, that you're strategically going after them for them to give you a pretty significant and large gift. What a major gift may be to a nonprofit that's budget is $250,000 a year is going to be pretty different from what a major gift will be to a nonprofit whose budget is $5 million a year. <laughs> so you sort of have to figure out who is your average donor? Like, what does your average donation look like? 
And that's where you figure out, okay, this is who our bread and butter people are. This is who we go after for our annual campaign. This is who we go after for our events. And then who are people who are giving at a much higher level than that? And again, what you want to determine as major gifts, it varies. There's a lot of consultants who have a lot of different formulas, but to some organizations, $2,000 is a major gift. And to some organizations, $20 million is a major gift. It just depends on where you're at. <laughs> 20 million makes yeah. me go, whoa. There, right. And so awesome. when you're talking that, you're talking colleges and universities, you're talking hospitals, you're talking organizations that get really large endowments and trust and things like that left. So if I have a small nonprofit organization and and I'm I'm probably in this thought process that events are actually my fundraising and my marketing plan, right? Right. Um, is there like a recipe that I could follow or a suggestion that you would have to take some of those different types of fundraising and put them like, like, is there one that might be easier for me or better? I don't know. It depends. And I say that, um, and this is actually something I, I do consulting on. I help organizations look at where their money is coming and try to determine where the best place to go. And it really does vary. It, base, it varies based upon where your income is currently coming in and what you see more, most successful. And it also varies based upon the skill sets of your staff. If you don't have somebody on staff who's a pretty good writer and you don't have the funds to contract out for grant writing, grant writing may not be the best place for you to go. Mm -hmm. Or you may need to spend time investing in somebody to become a good writer. But again, there's a lot of contract grant writers. I'm a contract grant writer. There's a few other people in the community that you and I live in, Monica, that are contract grant writers. And there's a lot of contract grant writers that you can find online. Um, so you just have to decide. Then when we're talking about major gifts, again, it's that you have to know who your average donor is. And then you have to know, do you have anybody giving above that level? The other thing is, is your board. Like, who is your board? Who can they connect you with? Who can they network with? But honestly, the worst thing that we can do is just every board is always like, oh, call Oprah, call Bill Gates, call, this, call that. <laughs> call Veterans United. Right. The likelihood that you're going to get an extremely wealthy individual who's never heard of your small organization to make a super significant investment in your organization is extremely thin. I mean, if you do it, if you're going down in the angles of nonprofit history because no one knows how to do that. Um, <laughs> but what you want to do is that is where your marketing becomes important. You need to develop a passionate follower group of people who are willing to be your advocates, who are willing to go out there and talk about you and say all these great things about you. Your board should be that. Your board should be advocates for your organization and spreading your message. But you also want to have volunteers that are doing that. You want to have just general people in the community who are advocates for you. And through that, you hopefully start meeting some individuals who are willing to make an investment in your organization. Yeah, events I, are a good place. I mean, events can be a good place to find those advocates and to find the potential for major donors too. Yeah, I feel like they they fit in because they're a good way to meet people. Mm -hmm. What I feel like doesn't fit in is when people are doing the same events that everybody else does, but they don't really fit into that organization's like mission and purpose, right? Right. So, um, like I was brainstorming with somebody the other day, they were like, well, we're going to do a concert. And I said, well, you're a homeless shelter. I don't know. It doesn't like they, they're not coming together for me. And like through our conversation, we came up with a great idea and actually a really clever non event for her to do. Um, and she was very like much wanting it to be an event. But I was like, well, you don't have a lot of help right now and you really need like funding. So let's, let's, you know, get as much as we can for as fast as we can. Right. Um, right. So yeah, that is when it does concern me is when, when basically people are doing events that don't really tie in or they don't use their event to market. I think that they miss the mark when they have an event and they're not developing assets for their marketing at their event or telling their story or, you know, right. that's what stories. I was getting ready to say. The biggest thing that drives me crazy when I go to fundraising events is when they never actually talk about what the mission, vision, or purpose of their organization is. 
if you are having a fundraising event, it needs to be tied to your mission, vision, and purpose. I mean, it's it. How do you have a hundred, two hundred, five hundred, a thousand people in a room and never once talk about what it is that you do or why you do it? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's you are missing a prime opportunity. And that is also donor cultivation and donor development is to have that conversation with people to tell them what you do. Along that same lines, though, you need to make sure what you're doing ties in with your mission and vision. And you also need to make sure that it doesn't exploit, especially if it's people, animals, whomever that you're providing services to, that it doesn't exploit them and it doesn't exploit their stories. Um, everybody's probably heard of just in passing and may never looked into it, something called poverty porn or anything along that lines. And literally what that means is it's, we all see those commercials on TV, the Save the Children commercials or the Humane Society commercials that just, I mean, I have to turn TV. They, yeah. it, they, it is a physical reaction that I have to those commercials. Those are exploitation. Mm -hmm. All intents and purposes, those are exploiting the people that you want to be serving, the animals you want to be serving. And so what you want to do is you want to do it in a way that it is showing the strengths of who it is that you serve or the strengths of your program. And instead of it being like, oh, we swooped in and saved these people and made their life so much better. Most people have some sort of resiliency or strength. If animals have lived in horrific conditions, the fact they're still alive shows resiliency and strength. So you want to showcase how your organization is building on those strengths. We're saying, we know they have these strengths. We know they have this. And so we want to help them develop greater resiliency, or we want to help them be in a better situation because they have strived so hard with what they have. And we want to help that be in a better place for them. Yeah. Every story needs like a beginning and a middle and an end. And I feel like if you're not hitting all the parts, you are you have the need, right? People need right. you. And then you have the solution and then you have the outcomes on the other side of it. And if you can share all of those things. And, and the other thing that I'm finding also as I'm having all these consulting conversations recently is that people just immediately want to go to like, okay, well now, now you should be volunteering or um, now you should be donating. And I'm like, well, I mean, actually, <laughs> No. And it needs to be like, you know, because this is the beginning of your relationship. We're not going to ask them to marry us on the first date. Your event right. is there to let you meet somebody and shake their hand and and kind of feel them out and have that maybe starting conversation or maybe not. Because I feel like a lot of the attendees, like events are, um, a lot of them are like the, the perfect peer to peer, right? Because right. you have some, you have an advocate who's bringing in a bunch of people that know you. And then and then it's your opportunity to be like, here's a story for you. And, right. and then those people want to see, oh, you're really helping and you made a difference. And that's why they want to latch on to your cause and work with you. But you don't ask them to marry you then. We, just let them run. And then okay. ask well, them to marry so you later. <laughs> there's two ways of going about that in an event. You do always want to make an ask in an event. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's no reason. No reason yes not to. No. Let me Let me backtrack yeah. on that. There are also nonprofits that are holding events for people who've been donors that are essentially just thank you events. Do not make an ask at those thank you events. Okay. That is different from something that you were promoting as being an actual fundraising event. Um, at thank you events, that really is a chance to steward your donors and thank them for what they've done and tell them about the impact that your organization has had thanks to their support and their generosity. In the same way, at a fundraising event, you're right. Do not ask people to donate the second they walk through the door. <laughs> That's not how you want to do it. Um, if you you want to tell your story and you want to give people the opportunity to support and donate based upon mm -hmm. that. And it's funny you said that because one of the other things that drives me crazy when I go to a fundraising event is if I'm really sitting there going, are they ever going to ask us to contribute? If there's all these great things going on, but are they going to ask us to contribute? Because if you don't ask, people will walk out without contributing. Like they, yeah, they, they don't know that they're not, that they're supposed to contribute. Um, that also goes back to what we we're saying is if you have an event that you're like, yeah, but it's great public exposure and it's this and that's that, that's fine. But then that's not a fundraising event. That is a marketing event. And you need to know that. And you need to know how are you going to use that marketing event and how are you going to find the right people to get there? 
So I am one of those people that has used a fundraising event as a marketing purpose to develop a new segment of donors. But you have to know your donor segments going into doing that. You have to know your marketing audience segments and you have to know where to find them, how to find them, how to connect with them and, and how to keep them, one, how to get them involved and then how to keep them involved after that. So give me an example. So of what you feel like a marketing event versus a fundraising event would be. Cause I'm wondering like, what's a 5k? Cause to me, it's a marketing event. I mean, you can raise some money on your 5k, but it's not the same thing as like a gala where people are sitting there and you, or a luncheon where you know, you're going to make that ask. You right. Know? So they're oftentimes referred to as fundraising or friend raising events. It's kind okay. of the difference. And so the friend raising event, it's more about communicating to people who you are and what you do. And it's that mm -hmm. initial soft touch of getting them involved and interested in you. I think a 5K is a good example. I mean, a lot of people who participate in 5Ks participate in 5Ks either because they're runners and that's what they like to do. Or like my friends and I, we do it because we need to get out of the house because we're going crazy right now. <laughs> so we do 5Ks. Um, it's, a, you know, it's just, it's more of a fun thing. The investment, it's it's a pretty low bar investment to initially get people involved. There are some really successful high dollar making fun or 5Ks. There are a lot that aren't. It, it just depends on what your cost is and how low you can keep your cost for that event. But at the same time, you want it to be impactful. So if you're if you're doing a 5K and you're doing it with the purpose of the person's going to get a t-shirt and they're going to get a water bottle and they're going to get a couple other things. And it's the cost of what you're giving out to people is around $15 per person. And the entry fee is only 20, 25, 30 bucks to participate. That is not an event that you are doing really to, to make money off of. Mm -mm. That is an event that you're doing to get your name out there mm -hmm. and to make people make people walking down the street, see a t-shirt that has your name on it and go, oh, what is that? What do they do? And potentially look it up. So it is important to know what the difference is too. It's also, 5Ks are an extremely hard place to make an additional ask. So whereas a fundraiser, the point is, they come in the door, you tell them your story, and then you have an opportunity to make an ask. Or something like a 5K, they pay their fee, their entry fee to be in the 5K, and then that's kind of it. You move on, mm -hmm. and there isn't a chance to do anything else. You may have games and things set up along the way that they can play that you make a little extra money on, but it's not based upon your mission and vision that you're doing that. So how many, like, would you suggest they do, like, a small nonprofit? Let's say that they do a fundraiser, and they do a fundraiser. Is that enough? Do they need to do more? I mean... If you're all volunteer based, it's kind of like a burnout city, but <laughs> right. And you know what? That's a that's a hard question to answer because again, that has to be personalized based upon what their budget is, what their mm -hmm. income needs are, what else they have available to them, or what else they could potentially do. Um, it that that is a really individualized question to really look at. Then. Um, Okay, so I had another question and now it went out of my head. This is what I get for not writing every question down, right? I had a couple that I want to make sure I talked about too. Okay, good. Hit it and then maybe I'll remember my question. <laughs> um, well, actually, I think we hit them. I think we talked about things, some of the things I wanted to make sure people know. Oh, you know what? One of the big things I would say, and I asked a group, there's a nonprofit group that I'm a part of, and I asked them, and I just asked a couple hours ago, so I should have asked earlier, but I said, if there was one thing you would want other people in, in the nonprofit world to know about when it came to like events and how you, what you do with them and what you shouldn't do with them and how they relate to marketing, how they relate to development. Everybody consistently said boards need to be involved. Like the board needs to be involved with putting your event together. It doesn't matter if you're only a volunteer-ran organization or if you have staff. Board need, boards need to be involved with it. And also that boards need to be realistic about what an event can do. Mm -hmm. And those are the two really key takeaways that was repeatedly said from the group that I asked about, what would you want people to know? Um, for one person specifically said, you know, my board, we're wanting to, we're wanting to buy a building and it's going to cost 
almost $4 million to buy this building and launch our new programs and our new services. And my board thinks we can do it with an event. And that's just not realistic. And if you think about it with what I said about what the ROI on a good event is, if the ROI on a good event, and let's say it's 50% because it's 50 cents on the dollar, both because of event cost and then staffing time. And it's actually probably more than that. It honestly really is probably more than that. You're looking to have $4 million. You're going to have to raise $8 million to have $4 million by doing it with an event. Yikes. Right? I'm going to tell you right now, I want no part of that. I would not <laughs> want to have to be the person doing that. I know. I do feel like people who aren't at, how, how do I say this diplomatically? I've been involved on boards where um, either there's a whole bunch of like high level, like CEO type people, or they're all um, in the public sector. And both are really interesting because when you're with all the high level people, they're like, get it, get it, get it, get it done. You can do. And I'm like, whoa, <laughs> I mean, realistically friends, no. <laughs> um, and then, um, and then with the public sector, they tend to not move very quickly because they're not like, so it's always nice to have a balance, I guess, in your boards. But um, yeah. so, okay, I have a question. Yes. Um, so first off, my first question is, since we said that fundraising events are not a marketing plan, would you mm -hmm. define for us what the difference between a fundraising plan or a development plan and a marketing plan are in your opinion those ironically those two are actually vastly different in the sense that a development plan is looking at what your income needs are going to be what your income actually is now segmenting that income out so you know where the money's coming from what percentage is coming from individual donors what percentage is coming from fundraising events what percentage is coming from um, the, for capital needs, what percentage is coming from grants? What percentage is coming from contract from services? So you need to have that all separated out. You might also want to know sources, like even further in there of like what percentage of those are maybe government grants or contracts for services? What percentage are coming from private foundations? What percentage are coming? You just really, and, and you also want to know how long you're going to keep some of those because a lot of times contracts for services are multi-year contracts they're not just one-time things grants may also be multi-year but they may also be something that you have to complete within six months or you have to complete within three months mm -hmm. or they may be five years so you really need to have a good idea of what that mix is i then recommend going out and seeing how does that mix compare with comparable nonprofits like you. Mm -hmm. You can do a lot of research on Google and find out a lot about this. If you don't want to do it, get a hold of me, get a hold of another type of consultant, have us set with you, and we will help you go through that. Then you need to say, where are we at compared to what a good metric is for where we should be? Do we have the staff? Do we have the resources? to get ourselves to this good metric. And then if we do, let's go and do that. And, and then it has like the strategies of like, what do you want to do year over year? How much of this do you want to grow each year? Who's going to be responsible for doing it? You have a, you have an identified development person on staff who's doing it. Is it your executive director who's doing it? Is it a program lead who's doing it? Is it a board member who's doing it? Is another random no, we admitted yeah. volunteer who's doing it, that kind of thing. Um, because we do have those, <laughs> and then you want to make sure that you have planned out what's doing that. Where so that's your development plan. Whereas with your marketing plan, your marketing plan is saying, Who do we communicate with? Why do we communicate with them? How do we continue communicating with them or communicate better? And who are we missing that we should be communicating with? And how do we communicate with them? That's sort of where you see the difference. And I feel like the overlap then is understanding like during your development conversations, all of the um, information that your marketer has about your target market and why they donate and right. what they care about and who they are. So that way, and having your development person communicate it back to the marketer because the marketer needs to hear those words so they can develop right. good marketing pieces and, and they really work together. I mean, right. I've 
literally had clients who will be like, oh, well, such and so doesn't need to be in the meeting because he's in development. Well, luckily I knew such and so, and so I called him and I was like, I'm going to be in your conference room around nine o'clock. I need you to walk in and get coffee and just sit down. Just sit right. down. I'm going like, would... to be like, hey, bring on it. Because I want to hear the conversations that he has with these people so that I can like advise them on what to do on their website. Because he's holding the golden egg, in my opinion, for marketing, you know? Right. So the big Thankfully, a lot of nonprofits have got a lot better about this, but a silo approach really does not work well. If you're putting together a marketing plan, you probably want to have your lead program person in there. You want to have your lead development person in there, and you want to have your lead marketing person in there. That's big enough if you're an organization that all three of those are different positions. They may not always be. Um, but you need to do that because you want to make sure that the program person who's probably most tied into the mission and vision, that they're communicating that and they're making sure that all the materials that are going out are communicating the mission and vision. Your marketing person is going to be your best person, ideally, to be able to be writing that copy, be able to be promoting that idea, the graphics that communicate that mission and vision. And then you have your development person and your development person is going to be your person who says, so these are the donors that we look for that we want to tap with these marketing pieces. But mm -hmm. your programming person is also going to be the one to be saying, these are who our volunteers look like if, if delivering your services relies upon volunteers or these are who our clients look like. Because when you're the marketing person, you need to be able to be marketing both for those who need services, both for those who help support your services. I'm sorry, not just both, but all three. And for those who actually financially donate to give to your services. So that marketing person cannot exist in a vacuum. They have to have the input of those other two sides. To make it happen. I totally agree. It's like when I go out to a client's um place of operation. I'm like a kid in a candy store. I'm like, yeah. this is so amazing. Tell me about everything. I want to touch it all or not touch it because maybe I could break it, but it's awesome. I love, right. I love hearing it. I love seeing their volunteers. I love seeing like the everyday things that they do. It really helps yeah. me understand it all. So another question that I had is, you know, we talked about how everybody's, you know, development mix and marketing mix is going to be different. A lot of the times I have people ask me, you know, do I need to do the same events year after year? Do I need to do the same fundraising asks year after year? Or can it or should it be different? Well, so here's what I have to say to that. <laughs> if you're doing an event year after year and that event is growing year after year, you haven't saturated the market for that event. Keep doing it. Mm -hmm. If you're doing an event year after year and it, you know, stabilizes and it, it just kind of caps out, but it's staying there. Like it's still, it's always, it's always bringing in right about a hundred thousand. Okay. That's your workhorse. Just keep it. Just keep mm -hmm. it. Unless that workhorse that you're bringing in a hundred thousand for is costing you 85,000 to do yeah. it. And you might want to rethink it. Yeah. Um, but, you know, just keep it. If it's a system, you've got down good to it. If you're doing an event and it's plummeting, that's what we like to call your dog or your problem child. <laughs> you need to get rid of that event and do something different. The bad thing is, is that those of us working in nonprofits and even boards, sometimes we get bored and we're like, we are so tired of this event. It is boring and we're tired of doing it. And so we cut it. But we cut it without having a plan of what we're going to replace it with. And then suddenly that event that was just your like steady workhorse, just always brought in this money. We cut it. We're tired of it. You know, it's, it's $50,000. We're just tired of doing it. We're bored. We're going to find something else. But you haven't built or groomed something else up to replace that $50,000. You're going to be in trouble if you don't have a replacement for that kind of money. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's important that, yeah, you can cut them, but make sure if you're cutting them, you have something to replace it. As far as should I always be doing something different? There is something to be said. If something's successful and you probably want to give an event a couple years to see if it's going to catch on. It's like a business cycle. 
you know, you'll usually find a business cycle. You're looking at anywhere from three to seven years, depending on what it is. Now, granted, if you lose your shirt completely the first year on the event, yeah, you probably want to come up with something else. Unless it's 2020, in which case all bets are off because this year, <laughs> nothing's making sense. Nobody knows. <laughs> right. Um, but typically, you're probably looking at wanting to do an event at least two, if not three years, especially if that first year you do the event, you get really great feedback about people telling you it was a great event, but you just didn't make a lot of money at it. Mm -hmm. Then that's probably where you want to give it another year to see how can you expand it? How can you get those people who came before to get them to come back again? Because it's a lot easier to retain people than it is to recruit new people. But how can you get them? Like, what can you do to encourage them to invite new people to come so you can bring new people in and work with them? Well, and I think, too, there's something to be said for the second time that you do anything. Yes. Right? Because it you just better know how to pull it off and what you yeah. need to do. And if you did a good job of documenting it the first year, then when you do it the second year, you'll be able to like what rely on all those documents that you had built up and all the right. processes you already have in place. So it shouldn't take you as long to produce the second year. Um, but it's still going to take time for sure. And realistically, I found it's usually about the third or fourth year before you really see how truly successful an event has the potential to become. And I say that, especially if you switch locations for any reason, if you, if anything about year two or three is different from year one, it's going to impact what the outcomes look like. And so you might need to, and you might need to move locations. I had one particular event that it did okay the first year and then the second year. And I was like, do we do it again or do we cut it? But the feedback on it was great. We took it to a different location the third year. It was fantastic. We took it to an even different location the fourth year and it exploded the fourth wow. year. And I mean, exploded in a good way, made a great deal of money, really had great ROI, that kind of thing. And so that, that really is it. And it had a lot to do with the first year we got in where we could, the second year, we went to a different place thinking it was a better, more centralized location. The third year, we went to a location that was more, um, it was more of a target location for the donors who were coming. And it does. It takes a couple of years to figure out who's actually coming to your events. Mm -hmm. And so then the fourth year, we took it to like the heart location of where our target people were who were coming. And that, that had everything to do with why it was such a great event. One of the things that I've heard you say over and over again is feedback. And yeah. I like that. So tell me how yeah. you get that feedback. You know, there are so, uh, first of all, I'm going to tell you, if you have a great event, people are going to walk up and tell you it's a great event. I can't tell you how many times after an event. So I'm an extroverted introvert. <laughs> like I can get up on stage. I can do my thing. I can make everybody happy. I can chit chat, talk. And then when it's over, I'm crashing and I'm like starting to withdraw. I can't mm -hmm. tell you how many times I was like, I just want to run away and go help my staff clean up that I had people saying, this was such a good event. This was this is like they wanted to spend time talking. And so mm -hmm. that's one measure. If you have people yeah. telling you how great your event is, you know, that's it. Mm -hmm. The other measure is to really talk. Well, one, what are your metrics? What are your financial metrics? Mm -hmm. What are your number metrics? How many people are saying we want to come back again? That's another thing to look at. Or we can't wait till you have this again. But you're going to hear feedback from the community. Your board members, your board members need to talk to the people that they brought. If you had any key people you knew who came, you know, if your friends, your family, whomever came, if your staff had anybody like that, mm -hmm. talk to your key volunteers who are part of putting the event together, who hopefully they were there and they brought people with them. Um, the one thing you run into with that is don't get hung up on the one or two people who are going to complain. Because it's going to happen. Most it's people gonna happen. <laughs> gonna happen. just be nice. <laughs> and but listen to what the complaint is. Was yeah. it a valid complaint? If it was something like we can't hear in the back, okay, that's yeah. something we can address. We can get different AV equipment for the next year. You know, so that's an addressable one. But if it's a complaint like I didn't like the brisket, I thought it wasn't. Hmm, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry to hear that. But thank you for your support. You know, <laughs> I mean, that kind of thing. Because there's some things you just can't fix. I had people complain because it was raining one time. 
can't control the weather, friends. It was an inside event, but they got wet. <laughs> it was a dressy inside event. They got wet walking into it. I mean, I can't help it. <laughs> what do you want me to do? I, obviously, you should have provided umbrellas in the care packages, and you should have known. Right, but somehow we would have, have gotten the care packages to them before they actually walked in the door for them to be able to use the umbrellas. I'm thinking yeah. like, you know, 2020. Yeah. We have to get them the care package before yeah. you get <laughs> <laughs> in 2020. So the, listen to that feedback. I mean, and, and listen to it. And here's the other thing. Listen to it non-possessively of the event. And that is the hardest thing because when you have spent, and if it's a big event, you have probably spent six months planning that event. And more than likely the two weeks before that event, you weren't sleeping, you were barely eating, you didn't see your family, you didn't see your friends because you were doing everything you had to do to do it. And your whole team was there doing it with you and everybody is exhausted, worn out. And so when somebody has a complaint, it's going to be super hard to like, let go of it and you have to let go of it and mm -hmm. I, I mean it is hard and no judgment here if you're like i can't let go of that because but you have to find a way because in my in my experience so there's what's called like the law three and it's if three people complain about the same thing that means it's a problem but okay. if three people don't complain about the same thing yeah it's okay. I mean, and if it's a complaint that's easily fixable, yes, do something about it. And actually, one of the complaints that you do often hear at events is, uh, is often audio. It's something that people can't hear very well. Mm -hmm. um, so that's always just something just at the beginning to check as, as best as you can. But just like we had a little IT collapse earlier, it happens even at events. I mean, you may go in, mic check audio. It may be great. Sound may be working perfectly. And then a speaker blows in the back of the room. There's just nothing new. Them. I just heard that noise in the back of my head of a speaker blowing in the back of a room. You know what I mean? Like that crazy squealing boof. Yeah. And it happens. And like your heart literally sinks when it happens because you're like, I know it's coming. <laughs> I know what's coming. Yes. It is. Yeah. And the scramble and the setup. So, all right. I feel like we should wrap this up. Yeah. We should try to answer our question as succinctly as possible. Why? fundraising events are not a marketing plan. Tell me. <laughs> because marketing is meant to communicate your brand, get people's attention, and fundraising events are meant to bring in money. <laughs> <laughs> Boom. So the t there are certain types of events that can be part of your marketing plan. And you said that those are like, like friend raising events, right? Right. And while you're hosting your fundraising events, don't forget about marketing right. while you're there. But also remember that the main purpose is fundraising. It's bring in the money. That's <laughs> really yeah. important. Yes. You're like yeah. a CFO for <laughs> nonprofits. You're yeah. Like, Give me the spreadsheet. I got this. And you know what? It is all about the numbers. I mean, mm -hmm. it's events are fun and they're super creative and if you're a really creative person and i am you'll get really caught up in the details and wanting everybody to have a good great fun time it's about the numbers like at the end of the day you have to step away and look at those numbers and i say that because that even comes with like you may be in an event that like the staff's difficult to work with or this or that but you know what if you're making more money at that event than you are before you just got to deal with that because that event is doing what it is meant to do. And that's probably also the other key difference is identify what you want out of that event. Like, yeah. do you want to make friends? Do you want to make money? Like, what do you want to do? You can't do both, but you can't do both as effectively. It has to have a focus of one or the other. Yeah. And I do love what you said about the feedback. And I feel like what I've heard you say multiple times now is like, it's, you know, it's the feedback of the people, but then to like, coming together after the event, this is what I'm hearing, and like just 
looking at it and seeing what could have been different, what could have been better, because I love the way you guys were like, you know, we're just going to take this to a different location and a different location and a different location, because right. there was something about that that wasn't working for you, whatever right. that was. And right. so just because you've always done it this way doesn't mean that that's the way it has to be done. And I feel like sometimes people get really tied into that. Right. Um, and that's. I mean, that's no way to learn. <laughs> right. And so I'm I'm just going to throw out a little plug here that um, my my partner and I at Colabra Associates, we have put together a tool to help people analyze fundraising events. So if if people are doing events and they want to reach out to us, that we don't do it for free. It is one of our consulting services, but we can help people analyze their fundraising events, especially if they've done them for a couple of years. We can help them analyze and then give suggestions of, what else they may look at doing to make events more impactful. That is awesome. We just actually talked about relaunching our um, online fundraising events boot camp, like in the fall. And my staff was like, so we're going to run ads for it, right? And I was like, and no, because right. <laughs> it's like, I it literally in the amount of money that I have to spend in ads, that's the same number of people that I get to sign up for the ad from the ads. I'm like, right. no, 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 we know we nope. We're just gonna email the people that we know and ask them, hey, you got, you know, so you've got another chance because otherwise I'm at zero and why would I do it again? Right. right? Exactly. I mean, that's it with everything. And when it comes down to it, nonprofits. Nonprofits can't operate on a strict business model, but nonprofits still have to operate with some sort of a business mindset of what do the numbers say about what we're doing and go from there. So tell people how to get a hold of you, Heather. So people can go to my website. It's colabriassociates.com and they can find my email there. It's heather at colabriassociates.com. Or they can also email me at Gmail, which is H-D-I-M-I-T-T at gmail.com. Spell Colibri. Mm -hmm. Colibri is K-O-L-I-B-R-I. And Colibri, in its various spellings, is a Latin language-based word for hummingbird. Hummingbirds have a huge meaning in my family and um, a history in my family. And so when my partner and I were talking about what kind of business we wanted to build, um, and we were talking about how we really wanted to like bring together the best experts to communicate information out to nonprofits and work with nonprofits. I said, well, you know, the, the meaning of hummingbird is as communicators and messengers of goodwill and good messages. And he was like, okay, that that's it. So our symbol is a hummingbird and that's what Colabri means is hummingbird. You know, okay. My last statement here, I love the way that you just explained that to me. And I wish that more nonprofits could explain their mission in that yeah. exact same way because I read it and I have no idea what it means. I'm like, is it a Bible verse or is it a mission? I am right. not like Shakespeare isn't working for me, friends. And I thought to myself, you guys are so tied into your logos. You're tied into your names. You know why you did all of these things and you could explain it to somebody. Right. But they're not explaining their mission in the same way. And businesses are the same way. I'm not just complaining about nonprofits. It's just like as communicators, like that was a really good job. Like you, I'm like, yes. yes. <laughs> I that, know that's I'm another doing. plan. Like that is your strategic, like your operating documents and your strategic plan to clearly identify what your mission, vision, and goals are. Yeah. So. <laughs> Awesome. Well, thank you for your time today, Heather. Thanks for having me, Monica. And thank you for everybody who watched us.